Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Well, good evening. My name is Daniel Bennett, and welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Uh, it's uh, Thursday evening right now if you're watching live. A couple things before I jump in. If you're watching live, you can ask questions. We'll do some Q&A at the end. I'm my own host, so I'll be, I'll be getting to the questions as much as possible um, at the end of this message. Also, if you'd like prayer or like to become a partner or anything like that, you can call our, our helpline. It's open 24-7 at 719-635-1111. I always wonder if Sunday I'll mess up and actually say my personal phone number live. <laughs> right. So anyway, 719-635-1111. And what I want to share with you all today is about serving, specifically about how to serve without falling into legalism. And so before I get started on that, before I start talking about how to avoid it becoming a bad thing, I do want to clarify that I love serving. I'm a fan of serving. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, th there's real power in serving. If you choose to serve someone else, what you're doing is you're choosing to multiply what they're doing. You're helping them reach more people, right? If you think of this ministry, right? If Andrew was all by himself, he could reach hundreds or thousands over his lifetime. But by having people who help him, he can reach millions, right? People who can film things, put things on the air, answer phone calls, you know, all these other things, right? There's power in serving. And, and it's just a, a wonderful thing where it's not about who gets the credit, it's about building God's kingdom. And so, so I absolutely love serving. And, and that's actually, I, I've, I've done whole talks before about just the, the, the value of that. Um, I think in my, um, uh, what's that called? The Inside Story uh, on the website, um, Andrew or Carrie interviewed me. It's um, Andrew and Carrie's show where they interview staff members. I was just talking about that, about just really, if you don't even know what to do with your life or you're not sure how to get from where you are to where you want to be, one of the best ways is just to serve, to start serving someone who's bearing the kind of fruit you want to bear and you've now entered into that kind of fruit because you're helping bear that fruit right now. And um, it's a way to change the world before you've actually had to build your own momentum to do it on your own. You just jump in and start serving somebody else. So, so again, I, I absolutely love serving. Now this message is a little bit similar to my one on giving where I had, I have a message a few months ago called giving five mistakes to avoid or something like that. And basically talking about how much I love giving, but it can turn into a bad thing if there's misunderstandings or bad doctrine or guilt or pressure, things like that. And so, again, there's different pitfalls that I've seen, <coughs> excuse me, in the area of serving where it can turn into a negative thing or it can become a source of guilt or shame or condemnation or a source of pride and um, just getting derailed or, or pursuing things, using the wrong kind of ambition in the kingdom. Instead of having a, having a passion for changing the world, it becomes a passion of like, I need to be important in the kingdom. And so I need to make myself look great, things like that. <coughs> excuse me. So. And the thing is, you can add death to anything, right? You can ruin anything. You can say, <clears throat> like, romance, add a little bit of death to it, now it's a bad thing. There's a bad version of it, right? Creativity, add some death to it, it's a bad thing. Giving, add some death to it, add some legalism to it, now it's a bad thing. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, I've got a little bit of a cough. Um, same with serving, it's a great, wonderful thing, but if you add a little bit of death, if you add a little bit of legalism, now it's a bad thing. But that doesn't mean that serving is bad. Right? You don't throw out the whole thing. You just say, no, this right here needs to go. I want to remove this part that's ruining it so I can enjoy the, the real part that's a gift from God. And so I want to talk about, I have four different uh, tips uh, to avoid pitfalls, how to serve um, without, I believe it's four, how to serve without falling into legalism or letting it become a negative thing that, that takes away life instead of giving life. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention it, but yes, this is Daniel Bennett. I do look a little bit different. Uh, uh, you'll get used to it maybe. Uh, we'll move on. <laughs> and so anyway, number one is that serving is not the reason God loves you. It sounds obvious, but subconsciously, a lot of people accidentally start to think, I need to do things for God because he did these things for me. And this is how I show my thankfulness. And that now it's like my, my serving is tied to how much he blesses me or cares about me. Right. <clears throat> Very few people would say that. But, but it's an easy thing to subconsciously start thinking. And so God, serving is not the reason God forgave our sins. Serving is not the reason God heals us. Serving is not the reason God blesses us. Those are all free gifts. It's a free gift. When God gives us Jesus, he gives us all of that. And so we don't earn this. And again, it's, you know, if somebody starts saying like, man, I started serving and all of a sudden these blessings started happening, 
oh, so, oh, God, God's blessing me because I'm working for him now. That's not really the right mindset. Now it's turning into you thinking you're earning something. Serving is supposed to be overflow. It's not supposed to be how we cause God to do things in our lives, where it's like, if I serve harder, if I give more, if I pray harder, if I read 12 hours a day, read the Bible 12 hours a day, uh, then I will get God to move in my life. That's not how this works. Again, it's taking a good thing and just adding a little bit of lie to it. And now the whole thing is bad, but you don't have to throw the whole thing out. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10 say, actually, I don't think I've got all of 8 through 10 here, but Ephesians 2, verse 8 is, says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Right, so by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's a gift from God. That's how you've been saved. That's how you've been healed. That's why God loves you. God loved you while you were still a sinner. Right, so again, it's easy when, when we're getting born again, when we're talking about evangelism, it's very easy to say, well, this is a free gift. I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything for it. It's a free gift. But then sometimes there's that switch of, well, now that I'm in the kingdom, I owe it to God to serve him. I owe it to God to work, 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 work. Um, and if it doesn't happen naturally, many times what happens is other people, other Christians will kind of put that pressure on you. And so what happens sometimes, and I'm just sharing things that I've observed over the years, is that sometimes people will get born again and then they immediately start serving because they're so thankful, they're so excited, they're so in love with God, they're just so thrilled. And they're like, my goodness, this is amazing. And they just start serving, serving, serving. They show up every time the doors are open at church. They just volunteer for everything they possibly can. And what can happen unintentionally is that now they associate serving with that amazing sense of just God's love and presence with them, right? The, that, that first love of like, man, I just love God and I just love serving. And it can get combined where now it's like, well, now serving, again, it's, it's easy to accidentally start thinking, um, when I first got born again and I was madly in love with Jesus, I was serving like crazy. Therefore, serving like crazy is how I feel that way. And, and, and tying them together in the wrong way when actually it was just overflow. And so, again, it's easy just to jump in. See, for me, it's, it's a bit of a blessing. I mean, there, it's, there's a lot of blessing to this. But I got born again when I was four. <coughs> Excuse me again. I got born again when I was four. And uh, when you're four, you can't do much for God, all right? You can do maybe a, a little thing here or there, be kind to your sibling or share something. But it's not like I could immediately just start working, right? It's like, I'm going to start serving God. I'm going to go um, door to door ministry. I'm going to go, right? And so because of that, I just got used to the fact that, well, God loves me because he loves me, right? He, he, he blesses me just because he likes me. I'm his child. And so I got to just focus on my friendship with God and enjoying God's presence and his company because serving wasn't even a, an option for me at the time um, in a major way, right? I mean, again, four years old. And so growing up, it was, man, I, I, want to, I want to do things to bless God back, but it was never associated with my relationship with him in the sense of like, this is how I earned something. So for me, I got to be protected from that a bit because again, like I said, I see some people get born again and immediately feel like they have to serve, 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 serve. And, and they're so excited and because everyone wants people to serve and everybody needs volunteers, Everyone encourages it. Keep serving more, serve more. Uh, you know, if, and some people even have bad doctrine and they're like, if you love Jesus, you won't complain. And if you love Jesus, you'll do this. And the next thing you know, it just turns into this negative thing where now it's like, I dread it. Now I feel guilty because I dread it because it's, I don't want to, but oh my goodness, I'm so ashamed that I don't want to because now I think that I don't love Jesus if I don't, right? And you might be burning out in the natural actions that you're doing in the natural dead works and you don't realize it because you're doing it out of, out of obligation because it started as a good thing and then it turned into a bad thing. Um, I'll try to balance this stuff out. Again, some of you might be scared like, Daniel, what are you talking about? You can't tell people not to serve. Um, don't worry, like I said, I love serving. I'm a huge fan of serving, but I love serving as overflow, not serving out of peer pressure, not serving out of guilt trips, not serving out of condemnation, not, you know, but, but true serving where it's kind of like, I just really want to do this. and so. Anyway, it's easy to associate serving with God's love if you started serving the minute you experienced God's love. And, and they're not, that it's, serving does not cause God's love. Receiving God's love is what can lead to serving. <clears throat> so we want to get it in the right direction. So uh, one example I have for this is a Christmas tree. And I may have shared this before, but I really enjoy uh, this metaphor. Is that a Christmas tree, you can decorate it. 
and you can put all kinds of lights on it and you know all these little like my family we have you know Christmas tree every year we buy new ornaments to kind of commemorate the year one for every person we it's getting fuller and fuller the thing probably weighs a ton by the time you know it's covered in ornaments you can cover a Christmas tree in all kinds of decorations but the thing is is it's dead Chris, right either it's plastic so it never was alive right or it was a tree and now it's dead because it's in your living room <coughs> and so that's very similar to legalism you're decorating the outside but it's dead because again, true fruit, right? A fruit tree, you don't just walk up to an apple tree and say, that's an apple tree, I should hang apples on it. No, an apple tree grows the fruit from within. Same with serving, same with giving, same with kindness and all joy and all these things. If we, if we say, I'm supposed to look like this, my tree is supposed to look decorated. I need to add these things to it. Now you've stepped into legalism. My own works need to make this look alive. When in reality, it's no, just be alive. And these things will start flowing through you, right? Be connected to the vine and Jesus' fruit will start growing through us. Again, like I said, you don't hang apples on an apple tree. You let the apple tree just grow them. It takes more patience, and, but it takes more, it takes life. You have to be alive. And so, again, that's what can happen sometimes is you might look around and say, oh my goodness, everyone's doing these things and acting this way and acting that way. I need to decorate myself to look like them. And then we fall into trying to keep up in the peer pressure and, and it's a bunch of Christmas trees. And so you walk into a church full of Christmas trees and you're like, wow, they're pretty, but they're dead, right? When it, it's, that's not what God wants. God wants us to be orchards, right? Where it's just like, wow, look at all the fruit just growing, all the fruit and the flowers and all this life just blossoming and multiplying um, because it's alive and it's flowing from within, from God's life within us. And I will, I will mention James 2.20. Um, I want to touch on this because, again, I want to make sure I'm giving a kind of a balanced approach to this. But James 2.20 says, but do you... Um, do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Right? So faith without works is dead. But that does not say faith is what makes the, or sorry, the works are required for the faith to be alive. It's basically saying what I'm just talking about. If you have a living tree, it will bear fruit. If, it's, if a fruit tree is not bearing fruit, right, you're saying, okay, this is dead. And so it's not that your works are what cause it to be alive. It's just this, the evidence. If it's not bearing fruit, then it's not alive. If it's bearing fruit, it's alive. So this is not saying that you have to do works in order for your faith to become alive. It's saying if your faith is alive, this will just happen. This is something that will naturally flow from you. Unless you get bad doctrine to stop you up. It just, it's just normal for what's in your spirit to just flow through you into the world. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's number one, is that your works, you know, serving is not the reason why God loves you. Sounds really obvious, but again, God loves you. It's a free gift. That's why he blesses you, heals you, wants to bless your family, the whole deal. So, number two, <clears throat> how you serve is not your identity. It's very easy for what we do to become what we are, right? Even when you're a child, people always say things like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're always referring to your career. And, and that's very limiting because, well, that's what you do is not who you are. It's a facet of who you are. It's a facet. It's an expression of what you do. But again, that just because you do something, right? If you're an evangelist, well, what, what, you know, and you say, well, that's just who I am. I'm, a, I'm an evangelist. That's my identity. Or if you're a missionary, well, I'm a missionary. That's my identity. If you're an usher, I'm an usher. If you're a CEO of a company, if you're whatever, right? If we, if we say what I do is my identity, we're missing the point because we're basically limiting ourselves to this world. So let me, let me, um, yeah, in this, in this natural life, it's easy to try to, try to grab our, the identity that we want, right? You can say, I want that title. I want to be a pastor. I want the title of pastor. I want to be a missionary. I want to be a writer. I want to be um, a mom, a dad. <clears throat> and so you can get a title where people tell you, like, I acknowledge this is your title. And it's easy to say, like, well, this is my identity. And it can be like what people think about you, or it could just be truly you're looking for identity, and so you're trying to find, like, what's my place in this world? I, I want to know my title just for me, or maybe it's because of how you want people to think about you. But again, your identity comes from Jesus. It's a free gift, just like I talked about in the last one. See, in this world, you can get a title. If you work harder, you might get a bigger title. Maybe someone gets the title that you wanted, and now you're disappointed. That's the identity I wanted, and they got it, and I wanted that one. Or I need to work harder. I need to compete with this person for the title that I want, things like that. Or there could be comparison or competition, right? Where it's like, oh, you know, you're an evangelist. Pff, I'm a pastor. I outrank you, right? Or 
Um, oh, you're in the children's ministry team at church? Well, I'm on the prayer team at church. I'm more spiritual than you, right? And things like that. And it's like, what you do is not your identity. It's not your value. It's not your importance. It's just what you're doing right now. There's, and, and I'll get to that more in a little bit. But your identity is a gift from God. It's a gift from Jesus. You don't have to compete for your identity. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work harder to try and get a better one. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures is Revelation 2.17. Revelation 2.17 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on this stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So this is Jesus talking to the churches, and he says, To him who overcomes, in that second half, I will give him a white stone, and in that stone is a name that no one knows except him who receives it. And again, in the Bible, names are not just like sounds, names are associated with your identity, right? With Abraham, where God changed his name because he's saying, no, you're not just a prince, you're the father of many nations, right? So your name is associated with identity. And so here we see, if we overcome, he's going to give us a name. This is who you are, this is who I created you to be. And so it's, it's not in jeopardy. It's not like, I, this is the name I wanted to give you, but you didn't do as good as I thought you would in your lifetime, so I have to give you a lame name instead. It's not how it is. It's a free gift of who he designed you to be for all eternity. And it's not just tied to what you do in this lifetime. So a quick example, right? Imagine that you're an evangelist and you make that your whole identity. And then you get to heaven. We don't need evangelists in heaven. Who are you? Right? Your, your, your identity just evaporated. You're like, well, all, everything about my personality, everything about who I am, everything about how I see myself and my value and how I compare myself to others was evangelist. But in heaven, we don't need evangelists. Right? And so, again, your true identity is an eternal one. And that can be true for anything, right? If you say, if you make your whole identity, well, I'm a pastor, I'm a parent, I'm, I'm a missionary, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm the head usher, I'm the custodial team leader, whatever it is. If you say, what I'm doing to serve is my identity, that's going to fade away. See, you're true, and, and I'm not saying that that can't be part of your identity in this lifetime. But I'm saying, like, we, we're missing out if that's how we, how we focus, if that's what we care about most. So... <clears throat> You know, and if that's true with ministry type roles, how much more so with other types of roles? If we find our identity in our actions or what people think about us or our reputation or how much money we have or how much people, you know, how popular we are, things like that. If we find our identity in those things, then in eternity, we're starting from scratch. Like, I don't even know who I am because um, I found my identity in things that are, that are gone. They passed away. And so if we find our identity in temporary things, we're missing out. And so the best titles are actually relationship titles, right? I'm a child of God. I'm a friend of God. In eternity, that's still going to be true. And so to me, it's much better to focus on that and say, I'm going to focus on the fact that I'm a child of God, that I'm a friend of God, and things like that, and say, that's going to be true now, and that's going to be true later. And because it's true now, God, how do, you, how, how do I overflow in this lifetime? In eternity, how do I enjoy eternity with you now? Based on that. Because again, eternity is not the ending, it's really the beginning. Once we enter into eternity and the new heaven, new earth, we're still going to have identities, we're still going to live life. We still have a calling, right? This isn't just our only calling. We have a calling and a purpose, and a, we're going to enjoy life forever. And so it's, it's not just based off of our temporary identity right now. So, and number three. So number two was that, let me see, how did I phrase this? Um, how you serve is not your identity. Don't find your identity just in what you do. And again, because especially, now some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about, Daniel. I've never struggled with that. I get it. But some of you are worker bees, right? You work, 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 work. You serve, serve, serve. You volunteer every free moment that you have, and that's all you do. And, and, and that can be a good thing if it's overflow. But what I'm encouraging you to do is to not let it turn into um, how you see yourself, you're not earning, like, no, this is, if I stopped doing that, I don't even know who I am anymore. So I'm saying, no, don't find your value in that. Find your value in your relationship with God and let the, let the rest be overflow. So number three is that it still counts if you're serving in something that doesn't, isn't a, a formal volunteer position, an official volunteer position. What I mean by that, right, it's, it's not like God's up there in heaven saying, like, well, you just helped that person out on the street, but that's not a real serving position. If, if you don't have the title, if you're not actually serving at your church or serving at a ministry, it doesn't count. No, serving's a lifestyle. Serving's a mindset. 
It's about putting others before ourselves and finding opportunities to bless people, finding opportunities to do things because it's just something that we want to do. We just love people and we're looking for ways to bless people and, uh, and, and do things for them, short term, long term, whatever. Right? And one example of this is that here at Karis, um, I had a student come up to me once. Here we have service hours. So we require students to serve a certain number of hours every semester because uh, serving is part of, we want people to learn how to serve. It's part of discipleship. And so someone came to me and said, I don't know what to do. I have a special needs child and, and I, I don't have free time for this. And so I'm not able to serve to meet the hours. And so I told her, you are serving. We'll waive that requirement, right? It's like you're serving your, your child. That counts, right? And so, and again, in the kingdom in general, sometimes people say, well, if, it's, if I'm not serving at church, it doesn't count, but it's, Again, it's a lifestyle. Serve your spouse, serve your children, serve your family, your friends, serve, serve your neighborhood, serve strangers at the grocery store, right? It's a lifestyle. So it's not like, well, if I don't have an official position, it doesn't count. Um, you know, because again, in some, some, some environments, there can be that peer pressure that if you're not showing up and working as hard as everybody else to get something done, that you just don't love Jesus as much. And that's again, we're talking about how to serve without it turning into legalism, is to realize it's a lifestyle. And so, um, yeah, there, yeah, there's different seasons in life, and that's okay. See, when I was single, I could, I could uh, go all over the world, I could serve 24-7, I could, I could do everything. I could be the first one to show up, the last one to leave, I, I, would, I was happy to do anything. I'll, pick up the trash, I'll do, I'll do whatever, I'll, I'll do every single job that's needed, anything that's needed, I'll just do that. I could do that. I could just serve, I could be on call 24-7, and, uh, and that, was, that was a great season. But then when I became married, I couldn't serve at that same level, but at the same time I was serving even more because now I was also serving my wife. So externally, outside of the home, it looked like I was serving less, when in reality I was serving more because now it's, well, I'm putting my wife before me. I'm serving my wife. How can I bless my wife? And then it's like, hey, let's do some things to serve together. So we did things like that. So that was a different season. When I was single, right? When I was single, it's like someone called me at midnight. Hey, we need help for something. We need to get to work. Awesome. I'll be there. I'll be there. When I was married, my wife wouldn't appreciate that if I just got up and left at midnight to go do something. I'm in a different season in life and I'm serving my wife. Doesn't mean I don't love Jesus. I still love Jesus. It's just, it's overflowing in a different way now. When I had kids, it changed even more. Because now it's like, okay, I can't serve the way I did when I was single, right? I can't just show up every time the doors are open, be the first one there, the last one to leave and all this because God, my, my family is my first ministry. That's who God's called me to the most. And so I serve them first, you know, and, and I've had to, to scale back drastically how much I serve outside of the home because they're my main ministry. And, and I don't feel guilty one bit about that, right? Some people can, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're not serving like you used to. I'm serving way more than I used to. If any, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's like, I'm serving way more. I need to put them first. Because I was even in a situation once, uh, and, and no one was at fault in this. This was just me recalibrating, adjusting, because I was serving at, at, at the church I was going to at the time. And a situation came up where it's like, well, to be faithful to my commitment of what I'm doing to serve, I have to leave my kids at home and I have to come by myself to church because it just wasn't going to work out, whatever situation was. And so, I, you know, and I was like, this seems backwards, that in order to serve the church, I'm actually doing a disservice to my family by not even letting them come to church. So I realized, like, I need to back away from this because I need to put my family first because them getting to go to church is more important than me getting to serve at church. I'm serving them. And so, again, I'm serving God. So even though there's no official title for that, right, no one's going to give you an award and say volunteer of the year. <clears throat> if you're serving your family, it's a valid way to serve. So again, stepping away from the legalism is saying it still counts. Again, it still counts. Is um, that's not how that's not how we're supposed to think about it. Really, is it's a lifestyle. What season of life am I in? How can I serve right now? Who's God calling me to serve right now? And if you're free from legalism, you'd be like, I don't care if people judge me. I don't care if people don't think highly of me. I'm not doing it for people to think the right things about me. I'm not doing it because I need a title. I'm just going to faithfully serve what God has called me to serve. And that means there's seasons in life where things change, right? When my kids get older, we'll probably do things where we serve as a family. Where it's, hey, actually, even right now, like, there's things that my kids are involved in where it's, we're serving the, the ministry here as a family. 
And so, you know, as they get older and older, we'll do more things like that. Once my kids move out of the home, then my wife and I will have more free time and we can do it, right? There's different seasons in life where you have different levels of time available for outside serving and where you need to do stuff to serve your family, where you need to do stuff to serve um, your community, whatever it may be. And so my point is, don't get legalistic about it and say it doesn't count if it's not an official volunteer position. Uh, Romans 14, verse 4 says, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Right? And so apply this to yourself. Don't judge. Like, you're, you're God's servant, so that's what counts. Are you, are you being faithful to God and what he's put in your heart to do? then don't let other people judge you. Don't judge yourself based on some arbitrary standard that others or some pressure other people are putting on you. It's like, no, um, I'm, I'm serving God. I'm going to do what he's called me to do. And maybe for a season, it's like, I need to back away from volunteering this much because God called me to focus on my studies. And he wants, maybe you want to become a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer. And you're like, well, I need to serve. I, I used to serve at my church 20 hours a week. And now I feel like I should focus on studying, but now I feel guilty because I'm backsliding, right? You're not backsliding if God's say no, the way you're serving the kingdom now is by doing what God's put in your heart to do. It still counts as serving. Like I said, it's a mindset, it's overflow. It's basically doing the things right in front of you that God's called you to do. So there's different seasons in life, different priorities over time. And uh, yeah, don't feel condemned if you aren't serving the way other people think you should be serving. It's amazing. Yeah, I talk with my dad about this because it's amazing how already everybody knows what you should be doing, right? So again, if you think somebody like my dad, where it's like everybody tells him what he should do. You should start this. You should do that. You should write this. You should do that, right? Every, and this happens to everybody. You, sh you should serve this. You should be on the band. You should be on the worship team because you have a pretty, right? Everybody is, is just brilliant when it comes to what you should be doing. But really, it's between you and God. And so don't let that, let, let that be encouragement but don't let it turn into to pressure where you're like, hey, that's a good idea. I never thought about that. Awesome. I'll pray about it. But don't let it turn into like, oh, my goodness, everyone's judging me if I don't do these things. Because, again, really, the root of legalism is internal. Where if we're free from it, we won't even notice those things. If, we, if, we ha if we're in bondage to legalism, everything people say to us, we're just going to interpret in a legalistic way. So my last point here is that, and is number four, if you burn out, don't blame serving. Right? Like I said, serving is a good, beautiful thing. It's energizing and life-giving. And if we step into the flesh, then we can burn out. Because now we're using our own strength. We're going to get exhausted, frustrated, offended, whatever else. If that happens, don't say, well, serving just isn't a good thing. Because this happens a lot. People will do something good for a legalistic reason, and then they'll get offended at the good thing. Right? If you love, if you love to give, and then you start giving legalistically, out of pressure and condemnation and fear, and you might say, ah, I'm free from that. I don't give anymore. Ah, I'm free from that. I don't serve anymore. I'm free from that. I don't read my Bible anymore. I'm free from that. I don't pray anymore. Right? That's not the point. That's like saying I ate something gross and now true freedom is I'll never eat again. It's like, well, no, maybe you need to wipe your tongue off. Maybe you need to rinse your mouth out, but don't give up eating just because you ate something gross. So same thing, right? Just because you burnt out in legalism or sorry, in serving because you start doing it legalistically. Don't say, well, serving's a bad thing, and everybody who serves is just legalistic, and everyone who loves serving is just bound up in, le like, don't start judging people. Just say, oh, I was doing it for the wrong reasons, and, and now I want to just focus on my relationship with God and let it overflow and do it, right? Take all the decorations off the Christmas tree. Say, I want to actually be a fruit tree. I want to be alive and just let these things happen organically as God leads me. So if you burn out, don't blame serving, right? True freedom is when our true identity can overflow. See, it's not freedom to say, I'm never going to serve again. I'm never going to read my Bible again. I'm never going, right? That's not true freedom. True freedom is when your spirit man, your inner man, made, made in Christ's image, right? Same as Jesus, is free to be who they want to be, to be who he wants to be. So that's true freedom is like, I can be myself. And the real you, if you're born again, the real you loves to serve and overflow and heal the sick and be kind and um, yeah, all kinds of amazing stuff. The real you wants to do those things. And so let it flow from life and not just the imitation. So yeah, if we, if we, uh, if we say I hate legalism and I'm gonna avoid legalism and your life now revolves about I hate legalism, I'm afraid of it, I'm never gonna do it, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not gonna, if you start living like that, you're still actually legalistic. All you did was change the rules. 
I did used to live by these rules, now I live by I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do that. It's still legalism. Typically when people get burnt by legalism, they run into the other ditch and they say, I'm running into the anti-legalism camp where all I do is revolve my life around not doing those things. That's still bondage. You know, true freedom is when we're like, oh, I can go back to experiencing and enjoying things um, the way they were intended. I get to just enjoy, again, generosity, serving, kindness, uh, uh, sacrificial giving, you know, all, all kinds of wonderful things that if they're done legalistically are terrible but they're meant to be really good things if they're just overflow. So, uh, to wrap up real quick, my four points were that serving is not the reason why God loves you. You don't earn it. Serving is not how we earn anything. Uh, it's not how we maintain good standing with God. It's not how we maintain favor with Him and how we, right? Um, it can affect your reputation in the natural, but it doesn't affect your reputation in the spirit. Um, it's all about our, our walk with God. So serving isn't the reason God loves you. How you serve is not your identity. Don't let it get associated with saying, this is who I am, is I do this, this is my job, this is who I am. It's like, no, who I am is an eternal being made in Christ's image who has relationship with Him. This is just what I'm doing right now. Um, it still counts if it isn't an official volunteer position, right? Again, giving, serving, giving, serving is a lifestyle. And so God will lead you to serve different ways at different times in your life. It's okay. It doesn't matter if other people don't recognize it. It's a lifestyle of overflow. And number four is that if you burn out, don't blame serving, right? If you have a beautiful meal and someone throws mud into it, don't blame the meal. Just say, okay, I, don't, I want the meal without the mud. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I don't know how many of you are in situations or have ever experienced anything like this where you found yourself veering into it uh, and you, you find yourself kind of not liking something that started off really fun. But again, I hope this is helpful for you. And I'll go ahead and jump to, to questions and get to as many as I can. So let's see, let's see. I need some water again. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so Leah Griffin on YouTube is asking, how can we keep from having the attitude of serving to get something from God rising up? Or the attitude with anything with God? All right, so um, how do we get, keep that attitude? I'd say is, is just keep, keep spending time with God, right? Let it flow from relationship. Just realizing, like, I'm doing this because I enjoy this, right? So, to me, part of it's taking your thoughts captive, right? The devil's the accuser of the brethren. So, even if you're doing something good, the accuser is still going to accuse you for doing it the wrong reason. So, that's one possibility is, you know, if you're doing everything great, hey, you're doing this for the wrong reasons. And you just have to say, like, well, no, I'm not. I'm doing this because this is what I want to do. And so, I'd say spending time with God and just, let's see here for a second. Um, yeah, serving to get something from God. Um, it's just totally separate the two. Just really focus on like God loves me and He wants to bless me and He's a good God, He's a good Father and I just enjoy loving Him and blessing Him. I'm not doing this to get something, right? It's like my children, th they've never once thought if I color a really good picture, Daddy's going to love me more. If I, you know, if I make my bed, Daddy's going to love me more. They, it doesn't even cross their mind, right? It's two separate things. I love them because they're just wonderful. I just love them because that's who I choose to be, who, who they, they're just amazing. And it delights me when I see them overflowing and, and growing and learning and blessing each other and doing creative things and stuff like that. It delights me, but it doesn't affect the fact that I love them. It's totally separate things. So I would just talk about God with that. If you keep finding yourself connecting the two, just say like, Father, I just want to learn how to, how to overflow and how to serve you and not associate that with what you do in my life. Just repent, really. If you start noticing like, man, I really want to be healed, I should, I should fast, I should pray harder, I should do this. If you start associating the two and saying, I need to do this to get that, just repent, say, sorry, that's, maybe I still want to do those things, but I'm not doing them to earn something. I'm doing them just to align my heart because I, want to, I know that these are free gifts already. So, so by faith, really. All right, so uh, I don't get to pre-read these, so I just kind of have to go cold turkey. So Ruthie on chat. How do you enter into that rest in order to serve from the overflow? Oftentimes you hear you must serve and with serving your, capa and with serving your capacity will grow. Where's the balance? So uh, I, I don't know exactly what messages you're referring to where people talk about you need to serve and the more you serve, you'll, you'll do better. So again, like I say, I'm a big fan of serving. I think serving is a great way to grow. I think it is a great way for the, the more you serve, the more you grow in your skills and relationships and experience and things like that. Um, but uh, again, rest in the spirit does not mean rest in the natural. 
Same thing, right? The Holy Spirit's the comforter, not the comfortable, right? You wouldn't need a comfort comforter if you were just sitting around doing nothing, but it's the rest in our spirit that then energizes us to overflow. But the, the way you can kind of know the difference is, do I want to, right? Is this a desire that's burning in me where it's like, I just really want to do this. And it's because if you're like, if you, if you dread the thought of doing something and you're like, but I need to do this to grow, <clears throat> step back, right? It's better to do something the right way than to just launch ahead and do it the wrong way. And so I'd say to make sure that this is overflow is overflow is a desire that you just are like, I just want to do this so much. I, um, I, I just feel compelled to, I just, I just can't, right? Um, say for example, if I'm resting and one of my kids, you know, I'm like, nothing will get me up. You know, it's like, do you want food? No. Do you want this? No. Do you want that? And I'm exhausted. But if one of my kids says, I need you, I'll get up. I want to. I love them more than I love me. So no matter how much I thought I was just going to lay there and not move at all, the minute it's like, oh, they need me? Okay, I'll get up. And so to me, just, is this a desire? Again, it's hearing God's voice. Um, you know, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. You know, so he speaks to us, he leads us through desires. And so, um, again, spend time with God, find out, do I want to do this? Why do I want to do this? Uh, you know, and just kind of try to clear the air. Uh, I, again, I encourage um, journaling of some sort with a voice recorder, writing it down. Because sometimes when you write your thoughts down, it helps you look at them and you can dissect it a bit more easily. You can look at it and be like, is this what I'm thinking? Okay, is this true or not? You know, God, what do you think about this? And so sometimes when our thoughts are very vague, it's easy to stay confused. But if we just take the time to capture our thoughts, to write them down, record them, something like that, we can look at them and ask God what he thinks about what we're writing down. And so, again, um, yeah, entering into that rest, I'd say is uh, enjoy God. Like, don't wake up in the morning and say, what do I need to do for God? Wake up in the morning and be like, hey, God, let's enjoy our day today. What do you want to do today? And just, just kind of get into that mindset of, I'm just enjoying life with God, and, he, and He'll give you desires, right? God's not uh, sitting around just doing nothing, and if people give, them, like, give themselves completely to Him, they'll just become lazy slobs. It's just the opposite. The more you give yourself to God, the more excited you'll be about life. You'll be bursting with life. You'll want to do things. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, Esther on chat, do we have to be perfect to experience healing? I kind of want to stop there, but I'll go ahead and read the rest of this. I have been feeling like I need to be perfect in my lack of unbelief. I know that I'm the righteousness of Christ, so I don't have to be perfect in works, but feel exhausted in trying to be perfect and getting rid of unbelief, or how else does healing manifest? Okay, so a lot, a lot in there. You kind of already answered some of your own question, but do you have to be perfect to experience healing? Absolutely not, depending on what you mean by it, right? So if by perfect... It's, it does flow from Christ's perfection inside of you, right? Perfection, completion mean the same thing. So it's like, yes, it, it flows from God's gift. When, you know, I, I talked about uh, uh, in December, I think I did one of these called Receive Your Healing, talking about how when you received Jesus, you received your healing. If you're born again, you've already received it. Just a matter of if we've actually allowed it to flow into us, if it's manifesting. And so uh, you don't have to be perfect to receive anything from God or none of us would be born again, none, right? The way you receive healing is the same way you get born again. It's a free gift. You receive it by faith. And so it's just a free gift from God. You can never do anything to earn it. And it's all, it's, it's one gift. It's not like there's 50,000 gifts that God has for us and you receive one, another, another, another. The gift is Jesus. He contains all the other ones, right? Jesus is the gift. He contains healing. He contains life. He contains all the other things. He contains joy, peace, all that. <coughs> So if you're born again, you've actually already received it. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, if you had to be perfect, none of us would receive anything. Uh, so you are very qualified. There's nothing you can do to earn any of this stuff. It's a free gift. Again, think of a child. What could they possibly do to earn the food that their parents feed them? What could they possibly do to earn the clothing that they have, right? They, they don't earn it. They, they, they are the recipients of their parents' love. Sa same with healing, same with every gift from God. So, uh, let's see here real quick. Um, let's see. <laughs> so, I, I'm being told there's messages saying that my beard looks nice. Thank you very much. I already knew. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Um, 
I figure if Julianne gets all these comments about changing her hair color, I should, I should do something to get comments too, you know. Um, so another question, what's the best way to minister to legalistic Christians? Uh, well, hopefully sharing the word, being a good example, you know, just be, being free, showing that, you know, I mean, one thing that, that's powerful about Andrew's testimony is that he teaches against legalism, and yet he's one of the holiest people you'll ever meet. And so when you show people, well, I'm walking in freedom, and I have better fruit than you, and you're trying to follow a list of rules, then it, your testimony, without you even having to force them to see it, just your testimony, like, I enjoy life more, and I walk in more holiness, and in more joy, and in more prosperity, and all that stuff. And people will be kind of like, okay, maybe you're doing something right that I'm not doing, right? Maybe, maybe you're right, and I'm wrong. And so uh, sometimes it's about making making people see what you have and wanting it, where people say, you know, you've got something that I, that I don't have. I, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I want that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, Jesus, Lord of Miracles on YouTube. Should we always ask God regarding what our true motives are whenever we serve? I would say no. I mean, if you're starting out and you're really confused about this, if you feel like you've been serving for the wrong reasons a lot of times, maybe there's a season we have a lot of conversations with this about God. But honestly, it gets very simple. You know, to me, it's, it's, it's uh, once you get through that stage of confusion, really it's just, do I feel led to do that? Yes, no, okay. And do, do I wanna do that? No, and can I do that and this other priority that God has for me, right? Can I do that and still serve my children the way I need to serve my children, serve my wife the way I need to serve my wife? And I wanna do this, I'll do it. If I wanna do this and I feel like it would cause me to neglect them, and okay, I want to do this, but it won't work out. Maybe I'll pray about, is there a way to, to adjust this over here so that I can, I can do both without neglecting either one? And so to me, it gets very simple, but like with many things, when we're starting out, it might involve a lot of conversations with God, and that's no problem. Hey God, am I wanting to do this for the right reasons? Am I doing this because I think everybody will judge me? Right, because that can, I mean, Christian peer pressure is a real thing. You know, you can be in an environment where you might feel very judged if you don't do what everybody else thinks you should be doing. And so you might say, am I doing this out of pressure? No, I do feel the pressure, but actually I just really want to do this. Okay, go for it. You know, and just having these conversations with God about it. So I hope that helps. Uh, let's see. So now Carly on chat, and this might be our last question. So what order of serving should the church have as its priority? Should they give all to the poor and needy or hold back some for the church and then give what's left to the poor and needy? For example, a food pantry. Uh, if this isn't clearly in the Bible on, you know, should, you know, any gifts to the church to go out to others or use it to ministry, minister within the church, things like that. And so to me, <clears throat> if something's not clearly in scripture, what is clearly in scripture is that, you know, local churches, you know, there's leadership structures. And so um, I would say different churches will have different visions depending on who the leaders are of that church or who the leader is of that church. And so um, I don't believe that it's one size fits all. Everybody must do exactly this and must do exactly that. If there were a set pattern, it, it, would, it would tell us, but I believe it's a bit more flexible than that. It can be a bit more organic. There's nothing listed that says 25% of your income must go to the poor. Excuse me, 25% um, of your income must go toward this and 50. There's none of that because it is, Again, it's a big world out there. There's all kinds of churches. There's underground churches. There's churches in, in all kinds of cultures and climates and communities and governments and all kinds of stuff like that. And so to me, a lot of these things are a lot more about, about having the right heart and then God will give us the wisdom of how to handle things in the moment. And so, um, yeah, to me, it's, there's a lot of different churches, right? Even here, I, I know great churches uh, in, the, in the nearby area where some focus more on community outreach, others might focus more on missions, others might focus more on evangelism, others might focus more on worship, and, uh, and that's part of the vision. And that's just God's leading people to lead in a certain way. And, um, and they all probably do their own outreach in different ways and do different kind of charity giving in different ways and they don't typically advertise it. So I've seen a lot of different ways and, and I believe that God will just give wisdom and direction to the leader and it'll fit within their vision and their style. So. Um, yeah, I believe that those are great things to do. But again, we can't do everything. It's easy to look at somebody, to look at a pastor and say, you should be doing this, right? You should have a prison ministry. You should have an orphanage ministry. You should have a widow ministry. You should have a food pantry ministry. You should... It's easy to just list a million different things that people should be doing. You know, we can't do it all. So we have to do what God's leading us to do. 
and trust that, hey, there's other people coming alongside who want to do these other things, and we're a team. And so as a body, we can, we can cover all of it, but individually, we can't cover all of it. So I hope that's helpful. Um, again, I hope this message is helpful. Like I say, I'm a huge fan of serving, but I've spoken with a lot of students here at Karis and a lot of people in other places who have been very confused because they love God and they, they love serving and they, they feel stuck. And I can tell from the way they're talking about it that they're, they're serving out of pressure and guilt, not because it's overflow and joy. And so I try to give people some, some different perspective so they, so they can kind of step away from the guilt and get back to serving for, um, out of joy and overflow. So, and have a great evening. I hope this has been a blessing and I'll see you all next time. Thanks. Our CARES Bible College has become one of the greatest things that the Lord ever led me to do. We've now graduated over 12,000 people. We have around 8,000 people right now in our program throughout the world and around 1,200 people at our main campus. And it's changing people's lives, but we are literally maxed out. And we had over 600 people that registered for this last school year and didn't show up and they said it was because they couldn't find housing. So I'm in the process of building housing. We've already put in the foundations for six dorms. We've got two of them that are framed in and that we are beginning to finish out and we're hoping to have them done by the beginning of the 24-25 school year. But we need all six of these dorms and actually we're building dorms to house over a thousand people which will be dozens more dorms in the long term. Term. Plus, we've got to come up with an activity center where we can accommodate uh, more classrooms, more offices, a cafeteria. We're going to come up with an uh, athletic center, and there's just a lot of things going on. I've seen this, and I've actually got an artist rendering of what these buildings are going to look like. And so I'm in the process of seeing things on the inside that I can't see with my physical eyes, but I can guarantee you they are gonna come to pass. And in order to do this, I just need people to join with me. It's gonna cost more than what we can charge our students. And so I need people to become partners. If you would like to help us make a difference in these individual lives and then in return make a difference not only in this nation but around the world, I encourage you to go to awmi.net slash campus and you can see an artist rendering and there's also a place where you can join with us. If the Lord speaks to you, I encourage you to please join with us and become a foundation builder today. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.